Welcome to the Statistics and Memory Grants module. So I'm going to start with a query that's a little tweaked version of what you've been doing before. I've added a field, location. So get me the ID, display name, age, and location for folks who access the system since 7-1 of 2010, ordered by last access date. Now, given these, of all the different copies of the table that you have, none of them actually have location. So what most of us will think to do first is we'll go grab the gray index, which has everything except location. We'll go make the list of people who match here and then look them up on the white index, the clustered index, to go get that location field. And this is the classic key lookup pattern that we saw earlier. We get most of our fields from the non-clustered, then we jump down and get one extra field out of the clustered index. But that's not the only way you could do this. Sometimes SQL Server will do it like this. SQL Server will look at all of our indexes and say, nah, you know what, I don't want anything to do with those. We're just going to stick with our good old buddy, the clustered index. We're going to scan across here, even though it's not even in the right order. We're just going to scan the whole thing, making a list of all the records that match, and then sort them, either in memory or out in tempdb. Now, why would SQL Server choose to do this route? Well, what if, if you think about in your data, the pages that you have there in front of you, what if instead of 7-1 of 2010, that date I was passing in was January the 1st of 1800? And SQL Server, if it knows a little bit about the data, will say, you know what? It doesn't really make sense to go back and forth and do these lookups and then a whole bunch of key lookups, or do these index seeks and then a whole bunch of key lookups, because what I'm going to end up doing is hitting every row individually as I do these key lookups. If I have, say, 50 rows per page, I might touch each page 50 times. That's a lot of touching and very inappropriate. SQL Server doesn't like inappropriate touching. So what it's going to do is just scan, look at each page once, and then make down those or write down those lists. SQL Server wants to do that because its goal is to get in and out of the table as quickly as possible. Oh, the jokes today. Um, it wants to get in and out of the table as quickly as possible to let other people go in and access the data because we are still worried about inserts, updates, and deletes happening. Now, SQL Server can't look at our data before the query starts. It can't look at the data in order to make a good execution plan. That's where something else comes in, which is statistics. For every index that you create, SQL Server automatically creates several matching, one, sorry, one matching statistic for every index. It's on the exact same fields that the index is on. Now you'll notice that there's also some other statistics that start with WA. These are system created statistics brought to you by the nice folks in Redmond, Washington, Washington WA. These statistics were created by the folks in Washington. They're automatically done for you because SQL Server recognizes, oh, you're constantly querying by display name. I should add a statistic for that, even though you haven't created an index on it. System created statistics are good because SQL Server needs as much data as it possibly can to make the best decision about which query, or which index is going to be right for our given query. So let's take a look at what's inside these statistics. You can use the command dbcc show statistics and then pass in a table name and an index name. Well, really, it's a statistic name. It's just that all our statistics are automatically created with the same name as our indexes. You can look at the system created ones too if you want to copy the WA sys numbers over into there. So returns three sets of results. The first set of results talks about the statistic. How many rows were in this statistic the last time it was updated, or in this index the last time it was updated? Our statistics get updated whenever about 20% of the data in that table changes. Now, it's really a little trickier than that. All SQL Server is really doing is counting the number of times a row has been modified. So if you have, say, 5 million rows, 
but you keep updating the same row a million times, that's going to count as one million modified rows, and SQL Server will update the stats on the whole table, even though we're just constantly updating the one row. That's not a bug. This is actually pretty good. I want to have a rough idea of when data changes. However, think about a data warehouse that's got five years worth of history in it, and we're only loading data one day at a time. Well, 20% of five years is one whole year. You could conceivably go a year without getting updated statistics. That's going to come in important here in a, in a moment or so. It also tells us how many steps are in this statistic, how many buckets are in our histogram. And then the next set of results there, the second set, says what fields the statistic is on. Remember our good old index, the black index in this case, is on last access date and ID. So this statistic is going to be looking at last access date first and then ID. The third set of results down at the bottom is our histogram. It tells us a bunch of buckets about our data. For example, the very first bucket, range high key, August 1st of 2008, there is exactly one row that is equal to that date. One person accessed the system on August 1st, 2008. There are no other rows in this range. Well, it's because it's the first bucket. SQL Server wants to have a special bucket just for the first person who is, or the first row in this uh, result set. Second bucket in there says uh, October 29th of 2009. So in the range between the last bucket, August 1st, and this one, October 29th, there are 8,390 rows inside this range. There is only one row that is exactly unique to our date, this one date. The rest of them are all distinct. It's not like a bunch of people all logged in at exactly the same time. They've been logging in all over the place. So all of the rows in our bucket are unique. Then we can look at the next bucket and the next bucket and so forth. You'll notice that the buckets aren't evenly broken up by date. It's not like it's six days, six days, six days. SQL Server is building different shapes of buckets to try and make the best guesses it can when it's time to run a query. Because when I run a query and I say, show me all the people who've accessed the system since 7-1 of 2010, now you see where SQL Server is getting its guesses from and where SQL Server is coming up with the ideas of which indexes it should use because it wants to know how many rows are going to match your where clause. Dun, dun, dun. All it's doing is going down this list of statistics and saying, oh, I bet there's going to be this many rows that match. What about in the case of last access date? What if I want to know how many people logged into the system in the last hour or today? Well, if I go down to the very tail end of the stats, the last bucket that's down there, I'm working with a copy of the Stack Overflow database that was exported as of mid-September. Notice that the last date in there is September 6th. Well, if I've got data that's constantly getting added onto the end in a date stat, but I only update it whenever 20% of the data changes, SQL Server has no idea how many rows have come in in the last hour, day, or week. It only knows up until the last time your stats were updated. And if you query for newer data, SQL Server is going to be all like, one, I don't know how many rows are going to come back. It's an interesting problem called the ascending stats problem. There's improvements in SQL Server 2014 that make this a little easier to uh, estimate stats for. But it's just an idea of why you have to be so good about updating your statistics and being proactive about it. Some folks, Stack Overflow is a great example where you want to update stats every single day because your data can change so much from one day to the next. In a data warehouse, it may not be as big of a deal. The next thing to think about is what fields does this stat really involve? You'll notice that my index was on last access date and ID, but this statistic only shows buckets for last access date, nothing to do with ID. What if you had an index on, in the Stack Overflow database, gender? So what if I wanted to say, hey, how many people have the last name of Ozar and are a male? 
Well, what if that index started with gender and then had last name? This statistic would say, well, there's about 5 million users who are male, and there's 5 million users that are female, and that's all I really know about the data. The selectivity of that first field is so important in an index. This is why people often say, put the most selective field first. That rule doesn't override all other rules. It still needs to be a field that you query on. For example, if I never queried by last name and I always queried by gender, select star from users where gender equals male, well then the moving around to display name first wouldn't help me at all. I need my index to match whatever my where clause is. But as long as I'm including multiple fields in there every single time, I'd want a more selective one first so that SQL Server's buckets paint the best picture possible instead of just saying 5 million males, 5 million females, that's all I know about the data. I need my stats to be as accurate as possible because they influence so much about building queries. Which index do I pick? Which table do I pick first? Should I do a seek or a scan? Or one of my favorite topics about that is how much memory I'm going to need for my query. See, SQL Server needs memory for three things. It caches data, which it's important to know that it only caches raw data pages, not query results. If you run the same query a million times in a row, SQL Server is going to build the results a million times in a row. I know other databases like the, the big O also does cache query results. We don't get that luxury over here in SQL Server. So it caches raw data, it caches execution plans because those are computationally intensive to build, and then it also needs workspace in memory for our queries. When I want to go join a bunch of indexes together, or when I want to do sorting, I need RAM in order to pull that off. And if I have a SQL Server with, say, 128 gigs of RAM, Maybe 100 gigs of it is dedicated to caching raw data. Maybe 10 gigs is, a, is a based off or used for caching execution plans. Maybe 20 is used for query workspace. I don't really get any knobs to tune that. So I got to be as proactive as I can to make sure that I get my query estimates as kind of close as I can get. I don't micromanage this usually, but when things go horribly wrong, I need to be able to recognize why they're going wrong and start figuring out which statistics are broken. Or maybe I've got my indexes in the wrong order. To examine how much memory you're getting for each query, you want to start by looking at the execution plans. Specifically, right-click on your SQL Server select statement and go Properties. And then that Properties window pops up at the side that you always close because it's not really all that useful. It is useful this time. Over there, you'll see Memory Grant Info. This is measured in kilobytes. It's really only easy to see with SQL Server Management Studio 2012 or newer. Good news, Microsoft gives you the latest version of SQL Server absolutely free. You can get it from that link there, SQL Server Management Studio. So regardless of whether you're using 2005 or 2008, you haven't even licensed 2012 or 2014, you can still use SSMS from those versions. It's totally okay and freely downloadable. Your memory grant info is shown in kilobytes, and you want to see it in actual plans, not as much estimates, because the estimates are probably wrong. That's why you're here in the first place. What's so interesting to me about this is that once your query takes flight, once it starts running, the amount of memory that it has is capped, and that's all it's going to get. SQL Server has to do this because there could be a hundred or a thousand or a million queries that starts after yours does. Even if there's a terabyte of free memory on the server, that doesn't mean you get all of it. You only get a small portion of it, and very small, very typically, because think about a thousand queries that run simultaneously, and we need memory workspace for all of them. And remember, we're also trying to cache data and execution plans. So if your query's estimates are wrong, like if SQL Server thinks that only 100 rows are going to come back, but actually a million rows come back, you don't get more RAM. 
your data gets written out to TempDB. Mm -hmm. SQL Server stops your query processing and says, well, hold on a second here. You got entirely too much data. We're just going to write down your working set over here in, in TempDB, which is the public toilet of SQL Server. There are so many dirty, filthy things going on inside here. The engine uses it for read committed snapshot isolation. DBAs use it for sorting indexes. Developers use it for building temp tables and table variables. All kinds of stuff. Even the newer features in SQL Server, like always on availability groups, even use it to capture things like statistics. I want to avoid hitting that public toilet at all costs. So when I'm looking at an execution plan, and I see a little yellow bang on one of the operators, like we see here in this uh, sort. There's a warning there, and SQL Server is telling us. Tells us it's in SQL Server Management Studio 2012 or newer. Again, remember you want to be running that. Shows us right in the plan. Boom! This thing spilled to TempDB because we didn't have enough memory granted to us because maybe our statistics were wrong, or maybe we're just bringing back too much RAM. This is a great argument for why I'm such a huge fan of local solid state drives for TempDB. It's one of those things that's just a slam dunk for a thousand bucks. You can make all kinds of performance problems go away. And when you see a whole lot of these spills, maybe you're going to have to fix it with statistics, query tuning, whatever. But if you don't have enough time, start throwing TempDB immediately onto solid state drives just to make a little duct tape on there to make this problem easier. So we talked about in this module, first off, one query, the same exact identical query, can get different plans based on your statistics. Remember, your stats automatically update whenever 20% of your data changes, and suddenly you can get new query plans. Ever had that problem where everything was trucking around, it was going along fine, and the next thing you know, all of a sudden a query performs poorly and you don't know why? Stats are a very common cause of that. You can read your stats with DBCC show statistics. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to be running every day. I don't even run it every day. But when I'm trying to troubleshoot why a query isn't performing well, it's a great tool to have in my arsenal. SQL Server automatically adds statistics, and this is good. It's extremely rare that you're ever going to add manual statistics. Let SQL Server take care of those for you. This is a really targeted case. And that's, those statistics help determine exactly how much memory that your query gets. Once your query's in flight, any additional memory means getting it out of TempDB. And then finally, use SSMS or newer, SSMS 2012 or newer, in order to see that memory grant info. So now start poking around in your queries and start looking at those statistics.